Hi everyone, my name is Sumaya Sharmeen and I'm the project director at Osgood Society for Corporate Governance, OSCG. Today, we had a fantastic event at Osgood Hall Law School where we discussed about corporate governance beyond borders. And we are so grateful that Mr. Philip Armstrong from the Global Corporate Governance Forum is here with us today. As you may know, OSCG's one of their goals is to promote an, the message and initiatives of Global Corporate Governance Forum. Mr. Armstrong heads the Global Corporate Governance Forum, which is based in Washington, D.C., United States. The forum is a multi-donor trust fund co-founded by the World Bank Group and the OECD to promote global, regional, and local initiatives to improve the institutional framework and practices of corporate governance in developing countries and emerging markets. So let's take a few min minutes to chat with Mr. Armstrong to learn more about his views on co corporate governance. Once again, thank you and welcome. Thank you very much. To begin this <laughs> chat, I'd like to first ask, um, what is the role of Corporate Governance Forum? Um, essentially, the challenge that uh, most emerging markets and developing countries, we confront developing countries, is trying to understand and apply this whole plethora of international standards uh, that have been set by numerous international institutions from the World Bank and IMF at one end, perhaps the OECD, and of course many other institutions such as Basel and IOSCO and others. And the, at the firm level, which is really uh, trying to understand how they apply these standards and what way they apply the standards, and to understand, frankly, what the benefits of those standards are to their business operations. The work that the Global Corporate Governance Forum does is really to try and harness this wide range of standards into a set of practical tools that provide best practice guidance. And this is experiences drawn from both developed and developing countries. So it's not just a developed country model, but really to try and find from our wide framework um, the type of standards and systems and practices that we think are beneficial to the typ a typical emerging markets environment. And then the next step is then to work with local counterpart organizations in these developing countries to really give them the tools, to give them the skills, and to give them the ability to lead these reform efforts. Because after all, they are far better placed than us to understand the environment and the markets in which they work and the dynamics that drive those markets. And then also they can set their own pace in terms of what their reform efforts can and should be. And our role primarily is to facilitate that process through our wide access to international standards and the translation or adaptation of those standards to a local environment that is useful to local firms. Great. Um, I think one of the terms that we'll be hearing a lot in this discussion as well as today's presentation is corporate governance. So I think before we continue our chat, I'd like to ask, take a pause and really ask you, what is corporate governance? Um, um, I think the problem is that corporate governance is one of the most overdefined terms uh, in existence currently. It doesn't matter which person you speak to, institution or country, um, everyone has their own definition of corporate governance. For the Global Corporate Governance Forum, corporate governance really centers around uh, effective boards, how they're structured, how they function, um, and then basically how those boards understand the rules and regulations that dictate their, their decisions and their behaviors, and then in turn how that process then translates into the reporting and transparency that naturally follows. Whether it's to a small group of shareholders, because it's not necessarily a listed company we're talking about. Very often we're talking about family-owned businesses, we're talking about unlisted banks, and we're also talking about state-owned companies. So for us, corporate governance is very much first and foremost centers around the quality and competence of a board of directors and how it governs a company and how it, it engages with management uh, to produce whatever operational objectives define that business. Okay, I mean in your presentation you had a very in interesting um, illustration of why corporate governance is so important. You brought up the recent incidents of Fukushima. Yeah. Fukushima. So I'd like to uh, I'd like to ask you to elaborate on that because the participants and all of us organizers thought that was a really interesting um, illustration. I think the interesting why I've always been interested in Fukushima was because um, the starting point is that corporate governance isn't going to stop a tsunami. I 
mean, that's the reality of what we live in. But the fact is we do live in a world that is volatile, it's unpredictable, uh, whether it's a man-made hazards or whether it's natural hazards. The issue for boards is to understand that business, to understand the risks that face that business, uh, to understand what measures management have put in place for that business, right. to understand and try to predict with some sense of um, reality and perspective what, are the, what, are, what could go wrong in a business and how would you respond to it. So it's not just uh, the ability to prevent an event taking place, because very often that's beyond our control, but it's much more about how to respond to catastrophic and cataclysmic events, having a board of directors that's competent in terms of the processes and procedures that it has validated and assured itself are sufficient for purpose, that you have management that are uh, fully accountable and well-versed and well-briefed on what their responsibilities are in such an event, and having ensuring that there are competencies from the board to the committees that serve the board to management and to the, the very various functional elements of a company. And I think the Fukushima disaster and the, uh, the, the, activity, the sort of actions of TEPCO, the company that was responsible for the nuclear facility, um, really gave rise for a lot of concerns. I mean, here you have, you know, we all know uh, that anything to do with uh, nuclear uh, is, is, is highly hazardous, um, and yet it didn't seem to have the processes to anticipate the potential calamity, knowing that tsunamis are common to Japan. Right. Uh, and then the second uh, step was this, the, the way in which the whole process was managed. And when we look at it after the event, and unfortunately with a lot of governance problems, we tend to have the benefit of 2020 hindsight, a lot of the weaknesses in the way the company was structured, the way the board was operated, became very apparent. And I think the one last point I want to make in this is that these days uh, an event in a company is not always restricted to the company and its shareholders and immediate stakeholders. It, uh, it has a much wider impact. I mean, you know, we are probably going to be for years to come still feeling the benefits of what took place in Fukushima. Um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, that we tend to look at the classic cases of Enron and Lehman's Brothers, which are, you know, more obvious candidates for the, a discussion like this. But I think companies have to realize, and boards particularly have to appreciate, that their actions and their decisions can have very profound implications, go far beyond their immediate purview. Mm -hmm. And another guest at the event was Peter Day, and he's a guru or expert in corporate governance as well. And he focuses a lot on the role of corporate governance in value creation. What is your take on that? Well, I think that's the bottom line. I mean, most businesses, if you have a well-run board uh, that understands its responsibilities and functions, it's not about just simply following a bunch of rules for the sake of it. It's about looking at how those rules add value to your business, how it enhances the competencies of the decisions you make and the information that, on which you base your decisions. And so, by and large, if you've got a well-run board with a, with that, that is functionally uh, creative and also decisive, but also has a good strategic and operational vision around how the business can operate, uh, it has a good relationship with management, management see the board as adding value to the way they make decisions, so there's a, 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 a relationship of trust and integrity, ultimately you're going to develop the value of the business. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the business is... That business, at some point in time, is going to want to possibly list. It's going to possibly seek a private equity investor. Or for some or other reason, it's going to want to expand. If it's successful, it's going to need to expand, and it's going to need to finance that expansion. Right. And that is then when the value proposition that Peter talks about comes in, whether it's a, it, it can access cheaper cost of capital or, in fact, even cheaper cost of So can we say that this is an universal concept or in your experience have you seen that adopting or applying these corporate governance norms or ideas in other countries emerging markets what were the difficulties that you came across or what how is it how is the experience of that um, I think I think the interestingly enough it all goes back to the issue of value and benefit I mean a lot of companies look at corporate governance and the first thing that challenges them is, why should they do it? What, right. what recognition do they get for it? I mean, in other words, if they have good governance 
will a local or domestic investor invest more money in? Mm -hmm. um, and very often that isn't the case. So the question is, and why do it? Uh, the second one is, um, as would happen, say, in North America or Western Europe, is the media interested in what I do? Will they report on what I do? Will they question the quality of my reporting and the nature of my reporting and, and, and test its integrity? Again, if the media is not active, which is in many of the cases in many of these markets, media, it's not that they're not competent to do it, it's just that they're not really equipped to understand the issues and the dynamics and the influence they can have on reporting and validating it. So there's a lot of those challenges that you see. But, uh, you know, the sort of example I give which uh, perhaps goes back a few years now, but I still think it's a very relevant example. We think of Infosys in India. It's a well-known IT company. It's almost an icon in the IT industry. When they first uh, thought about expanding, when they first thought about the need to access capital, um, the question was, do they list in India or do they list in the US? At the time, India, which is some 10 years ago, was not the market it is today, of course. Um, and that they felt they would gain much more integrity by listing in a much more challenging environment like the United States. And therefore, they sought a listing on NASDAQ. Um, that in itself sends a, a signal to investors that this company is serious about doing the right things and doing the proper things. I look at uh, the company I used to be the senior vice president of, which is Anglo-American Corporation in South Africa. When we... Um, um, when we uh, merged all of our Anglo-Americans' global activities so that we could list in London in May 1999, which at the time was the largest listing in the world, um, one of the things that was always at the forefront of our mind was that we were going to have a lot of in investors and media and others challenging us because we came from an emerging market and perhaps we didn't quite see the standards in the same way that developed markets did. So corporate governance was very much at the, at the forefront of everything we did. Every decision we took, well, it was critical that we could demonstrate that our credentials were as good as any company you would find in the UK, in Europe, or North America. Mm -hmm. And that uh, benefited us. And uh, in the discussion today, you also mentioned the consequences of the financial crisis on these emerging markets. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that as well? Well, the... the, the I mean, the financial crisis, one thing we must remember that in the global financial crisis that emerged after the Lehman's uh, collapse, of course, it's, 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 it's complicated. It wasn't just a corporate governance issue. And I think we, it, the, a lot of people conveniently talk about it as a corporate governance crisis. I'm, I'm, not, I'm in the school that is saying, yes, corporate governance was a part and an, and an important part, but it wasn't necessarily the only issue. There's a range of other issues. But if we just focus on corporate governance for a moment, you think of the collapse of Lehman Brothers that immediately, and, and I think well, the first thing that became apparent to everyone was just how connected the global economy is because that rapidly spread to other major U.S. banks and then quickly it spread to the mm -hmm. U.K. and to Europe. Now the problem that is now created is that these banks in addressing the various measures that have resulted, you've had, you know, obviously the, the, the issue highlighted political intervention, particularly in the European Union and the United States, as we saw with the Dodds-Frank uh, Act in the US, for example, and numerous EU measures and, and, and measures that have been taken in the United Kingdom. So you've got that step. The second step is then a, a really um, a tightening of credit, a significant deleverage uh, that took place globally, particularly around these major banks. Now the problem is that many of these banks also have subsidiary operations in emerging markets and developing countries. So the question is that they were so consumed by the crisis in their home countries and in their major markets that they immediately had to take remedial measures that did not necessarily support the continuing activities of their subsidiaries in the developing markets. So there was a tightening of credit. Uh, that, of course, is, uh, and, and that then became for, for companies and operations and small markets, emerging markets, was uh, getting access to credit, the access to uh, bank lending to be able to continue business. So the, the impact has been very significant in the sense that it's, um, it's, the, it's created a whole tightening of the economic system. Um, and because many of these emerging markets depend a lot on the ability to access very liquid capital markets 
and, and financial markets in Western Europe and North America, which are no longer available to them. Um, and the result, and of course, it's also affected the aid side because many of the European governments are obviously under uh, facing various forms of fiscal crisis, which has had a significant impact also on uh, development assistance. So it's, there's a whole range of activities, and it's, but it's just it takes time to feed through. And in my recent visit to Africa, that's become evident that there's a lag of some 18 months to two years uh, that is now impacting the operations of many, you know, um, effective and functional companies in these markets.